So I think we had very good talk on the surgical aspects of uh, uh, head neck cancer surgery in recurrent disease. And we'll be talking about mainly the recurrent disease. These are my panelists. So may I request everyone to please be seated. Vivek ji, may I request everyone to please be seated here so that you can have some knowledge gain. Thank you so much. So when I joined oncology, I felt that cytotoxic chemotherapy is probably the last word in oncology. But later on, I learned that molecular, molecular targeted therapy is there. And recently, we have heard about immunotherapy coming as very, very strong wage in various cancers. So we'll go straight forward for the case. So CA left GB sulcus, poorly differentiated, underwent chemotherapy plus radiotherapy. Within six months, the patient had a recurrence of the lymph node on the same site, which was within the RT portal. So next question comes, how do we manage this patient who has recurred within six months? So whom should I, Dr. Chaudhary, may I start with you only? At how do we approach this patient? Okay, so this patient... Uh... Okay, so patient is PS1 and uh, recurred within six months of the definitive therapy, right? Post surgery, post uh, adjuvant CTRT. So uh, this tells about the uh, one of the biology of the tumor, which is bad because it has recurred within six months. So uh, before embarking on the treatment or planning on the treatment, we need to counsel the patient about the uh, bad biology of the tumor and the uh, whatever uh, option we choose, the overall outcome is not going to be uh, very so good. So what will be the treating options, in fact? So uh, first, I'll, I'll consult with my surgical oncologist for if uh, there is an option of surgical resection to this patient. So first option would be surgical consult. Very right. So may I ask the surgeon to leave here that would you like to operate upon this patient? Uh, if you don't get metastatic disease, but there is a solitary node. So I presume that... Uh, Post CTRT, we have done a PET scan, which is showing only disease in the lymph node on the same yes, side, locally is. controlled and no distant metastasis. Yes. So technically, the patient fits into the criteria of a recurrent disease, or I would say a residual disease, and fits considering the fitness wise, should ideally be uh, operated. So I think that is very, very important that whenever we see a patient, many times we forget that our surgeon colleague and radiation colleagues do better job than systemic uh, treatment alone. So we should refer and we should take the advantage of the multidisciplinary tumor board and salvage surgery in re radiation remains one of the topmost thing, which as medical oncologists, we, uh, we forget in fact many times. These are the head neck guidelines. And again, it mentions that resectability remains topmost thing whenever we see a recurrent head neck cancer disease, even in a patient who had received prior RT, or patient who had received prior chemotherapy plus radiation. So may I ask you, sir, that what are the challenges when you are seeing a case for surgery in recurrent head neck cancer? So whenever we are talking about recurrent tumors, there are a few things which we need to consider. First is patient factors, like what Tejasvini Madam had said. Patient should be fit to undergo surgery. Second, the tumor or the residual disease should ideally be resectable and resectable with clear margins. There is no point doing half-hearted job where we might not be able to get a clear margin. Secondly, we also need to see what was what surgery was done before. That means we need to know the surgical nodes because sometimes, as you said, it's a nodal recurrence. We need to know what is the uh, uh, status, status of the IJV on that side plus what is the current scenario, whether the node is in proximity to the carotid where resection would be dicey and not just this node when we are talking about a salvage surgery in a recurrent tumor and a nodal recurrence i would always address the opposite neck so i need to know that igv status because if the igv is resected on the side of the surgery doing opposite side neck dissection would be my priority followed by the same side neck dissection and as sir said that we need to counsel the patient because these tumors have a, are very notorious and there is a very high chance that the disease might come back so patient, proper patient counseling needs to be done. And post-op, post-RT field is always a, it's a difficult field to go for surgery. And uh, we need to be very uh, sure that we'll be able to take out the disease completely. There are always chances for, for complications, mm -hmm. like what was mentioned, like salivary leaks, uh, carotid blowouts. If we need to put in any flap, flap failures, and a delayed uh, healing or uh, issues with wound healing is always to be considered. 
So thank you so much, Dr. Ankit. Very well mentioned. And I think you have covered most of the, the surgical part that how do we select and what are the plus minus points. So these are the uh, graphs which Dr. Tejeshwari has shown much better than these. That two-year and five-year overall survival in patients who had undergone recurrent uh, the surgical aspect, they do better. So coming to Dr. Anuba, that as medical oncologist, if the survey surgery has been done by Dr. Ankit and he has given good margin and everything, will you consider this patient for adjuvant chemotherapy? Uh, sir, as of now, there is no role of adjuvant therapy if you have completely resected the disease uh, because, uh, you know, there, there's nothing to, as such, we don't know so much about the micrometastases and things like that. So currently, if somebody's undergone salvage surgery, all the margins are good. Um, in this patient, I don't think re radiation will also be an option considering that it relapsed within five months. Um, in, there is no uh, data for chemotherapy. Um, immunotherapy also, as such, there is no data. What I would be interested in knowing, though, is the biology of the disease. Because somebody who has relapsed so quickly uh, is clearly a bad prognosticator. And actually, one of the very interesting questions that Dr. Aparna brought up, and I would want to know is, what is the congruity between the primary and the metastatic disease or the residual disease in, in the biomarker status? And because always getting biomarker is not that easy, can we do it on the primary? So, I'll, uh, Dr. Aparna, I'll, I have another slide for biomarker. So, your choice was to give chemotherapy, you will not give. Dr. Ankit, Dr. Um, uh, Ankur Punia ji, if the patient says that I want to go ahead and I have heard about immunotherapy, dastarolumab and other things, no financial barriers. So, will you select this patient for immunotherapy in this condition? As of now, no, sir. We don't have any evidence at all of using immunotherapy in this setting. So at present, not at all. <laughs> Dr. Divesh, anything to do with metronomic therapy? Patient will say, sir, kuch de do mujhe, wapas a jayegi. Six months mein do bar surgery ho gai, RT ho gaya. Yeah. Dr. Chaudhary, you want to say? I am pro uh, for this adjuvant therapy in this particular patient, which has recurred in the, within six months of the complete therapy. So I would definitely consider uh, giving adjuvant therapy, but after the one year, then definitely CTRD or within six months, so I would be uh, considering adjuvant chemotherapy. And if the financial barrier is not there, then I would definitely discuss the option of the immunotherapy. Though there are no data, but if the financial options are not, uh, uh, objections are not there, then I will be happy to give the immunotherapy. I think that is also very important that it comes to individual decisions. Dr. Bharat Bosle, what do you do in Mumbai if somebody comes to you financial, sir, no barriers? All I have in uh, dilemma. I think my, my surgery was done, but uh, without treatment, patients just want to. Um, uh, there is no data for further treatment after salvage surgery, but patient wants treatment. So what what should we offer? Some like what I'm asking. Of as a moderator, I'm supposed to so, ask you all. So, uh, <laughs> so I think uh, we can uh, uh, we can enroll in clinical trials. Uh, that is very good. Is, CDRT or radical RT, Vijay has put a metronomic and which we have been practicing since last 10 12 years. And clearly, it is a negative trial, so we don't put the patients on oral metronomics after no uh, recent two three years. And we have done that practice. Anecdotally, we have some patients going on for years taking, but we really don't know what is the reason whether the basic biology of the disease. So out of fear, practicing an adjuvant is not a right thing, especially the IV systemic chemotherapy or immunotherapy. There is no clear-cut data. I think understanding the biology... Yes, that is very, very important. Yeah, very Unless until we have a biomarker for that, uh, putting some patient after... And especially with those patients, Rakesh is here, within five years of... Uh, five months of recurrence, we usually put those patients on a systemic therapy rather than a, a local surgery. Unless until no, there is a... Strong reason, and it's a decision of a multidisciplinary team. Everybody sat together. Usually, these are the patients who go directly on a systemic therapy at our center. Dr. Yeah, Dr. Tapasuni. As I uh, see this disease, this was T1 N2B, multiple lymph nodes. So I'm sure the surgeon would have had done a complete neck dissection. 
Now, if this node has failed in the operative bed, and that too within before six months, uh, I fail to understand how can this become so easily resectable? Because generally, when whenever there is a nodal recurrence in an operated bed, and that too post CCRT, and the other thing is, uh, if it's an end to be the opposite side neck would have had been radiated. So doing a contralateral, if at all you have contemplated surgery, doesn't really sink into me. So a clinical situation given like this, where there is a nodal failure within six months of a radical treatment, whatever we are trying to do is not going to achieve cure. Absolutely. So what we are aiming is palliation. So if I were to assess this particular situation, I would probably look at palliative treatment rather than subjecting this patient to any radical treatment and giving him a lot of morbidity. I would move more towards a palliative systemic therapy than doing surgery and then subjecting him to chemo radiation, whatever. Very right. So we truly understand that the biology is very aggressive. And if the neck has not been addressed previously, then probably neck resection remains the choice. Correct me that if it, it would have been the sort of no neck resection, no surgery, CT plus RT, then probably this has got a role. And if elsewhere the disease is controlled in the oral cavity. Dr. Sudhir, any idea about the biomab or new, uh, the immunotherapy at this point? Biomab we have discussed. So any points of putting these patients on nematozumab or nivolumab? we have discussed yes sir there the role uh, there is the two type of role there we discuss about the surgery after surgery adjuvant but there is no clear cut data about that but both the trials are there for pembrolizumab and nivolumab also and second role of the immunotherapy if we go for the palliative treatment not go for the surgery then there is clear cut role for the recurrent disease both the immunotherapies of the nivolumab and the pembrolizumab but biomab in this, that situation after the surgery, there is no role. Dr. Divesh, if your surgeon says that currently this is not operable, but this is the only site of disease, will you like to give new advent and downstage this lymph node or the resectability I think in, in recurrent, recurrent setting? In recurrent setting, there is uh, no proven role of NACT, I think. So we should clear cut, demarcate whether this uh, we are going for a curative intent or so I think that is very, very important. And it has been tried that in the recurrent setting, new adjuvant chemotherapy does not have a role. And we should be very honest in our heart as well as we should be very honest to tell patient also that the intent remains non-curative in this condition. And it has not been found to be of uh, use. Salve surgery done, but not fit for re radiation. So this trial has been done where they have in Tata Hospital, Dr. Pati Letal and Dr. Kumar Prabhash team, they have done metronomic chemotherapy and they found that this also does not have much uh, value. So the next question comes local therapy about the re-irradiation. So that remains one important point. Dr. Samir, may I ask you that which are the patients where re-irradiation is considered a therapeutic option? Uh, uh, so, uh, of course, there are multiple factors, patient-related as well as the disease-related factors. Uh, talking about this patient in particular to begin with this was a t1 and 2 a disease probably had an ipsilateral node which was resected and had an infield recurrence within six months of course in this patient re-radiation was not an option but uh, uh, so if this was a contralateral uh, nodal recurrence i would have definitely considered him for re-radiation post-surgical uh, resection but uh, since this was infield, of course, re-RT. So, in general, what are yeah. the factors where you consider re-irradiation so, as therapeutic? Yeah, of course, uh, when uh, first op option, whenever there is a head and neck malignancy which has recurred, first option, the sur surgical salvage is, of, is always our first choice. Whenever they are non-resectable, uh, uh, of course, we discuss uh, these patients in MDT and when the surgeon feels that probably surgery, uh, they might not get clear margins or there are functional issues with surgeries. These, these are the patients we consider for re-RT. There should be a reasonable gap. 
the location of tumor is very important uh, just like what the surgeon sees whether it is how close it is to carotids is very important because carotid blowout is a risk factor not only with surgery but with rrt as well uh, so uh, these are the things which we keep in mind whether this is just a local recurrence regional recurrence or local regional both so uh, these are the things which we keep in mind when we uh, uh, consider a patient for rrt Dr. Sapna, madam, may I ask you the, about the re irradiation? Various technique, like you are dealing with the proton, which is one of the highest radiation technique. So, does the radiation technique play any role in re irradiation of recurrent head neck cancer? So, uh, I do believe there has been, you know, a lot of curiosity and a lot of enthusiasm about using proton therapy for re radiation. So I'd like to mention here that uh, proton therapy does have a role in the treatment of certain radio-resistant malignancies, such as chordomas, uh, such as, uh, you know, even sarcomas, inoperable sarcomas. However, when we are talking about a recurrent head and neck cancer, uh, which has recurred very quickly, then that does not apply. That disease does remain radio-resistant and... Um, I believe that that in that sort of situation, using proton therapy is a poor choice. Okay. So uh, when we have to talk about, whenever we talk of proton, we talk about the resources of patients. So uh, early failures, these patients are not going to do well, whatever the modality of radiation. Yes, proton therapy is useful for re-radiation if a patient is a good prognosis patient. It's still not a substitute for surgery, but yes, post-surgery as an adjuvant or in patients who are not candidates for surgery, but a reasonable gap and small volume disease, those would be the patients who would qualify for proton therapy. Thank you. So I think that is very important to know the biology and how much is the gap between the last uh, uh, surgery or chemo uh, radiation and when the patient relapses. So these are various trials. Again, they highlight that the uh, Local treatment should be always be considered in relapse setting. So next comes about the chemotherapy part, and these are various options, and we all love chemotherapies. So these are the different milestones achieved, and we can see that various drugs are rapidly coming. And in the era of immunotherapy, we have immunotherapy mentioned as first-line treatment, like we can see Pembro and Nivolumab, both have been mentioned as first-line. And these are the other drugs, including cetuximab and other options available. So the question comes that how do you select doublet, triplet, or single agent? So let me start with Dr. Ankur Punia. When a patient comes with recurrent disease, how do you select sitting in your clinic? So first thing matters is what is the performance status of the patient, what kind of any comorbidities he has. For a fit patient, yes, a triplet combination would be the better. And eventually it depends what kind of treatment we'll give on what kind of comorbidity. Next thing which matters is to do a PDL1 testing nowadays. PDL1 testing defines as the patient is a PDL1 positive, then yes, immunotherapy combination would be the best for the patient. If no, then maybe Sutuximab combination. And if thirdly, if financial thing is there, then yes, metronomic is a good option. And then low dose immuno metronomic again a good option. So it depends on you know performance status. Uh, comorbidities and uh, how much symptomatic the patient is that also makes a difference patient with a huge burden of disease might not be able to tolerate you know triplet therapy so that also makes a difference so dr anuba if the patient has no financial barriers uh, ps1 right. final pocket full with everything but so, so I think Dr. Punia very rightly pointed out that uh, knowing the PDL one status would really help us to determine which way to go, and and I agree with him also in the sense that somebody who's very symptomatic, um, I would whatever I choose in addition, I would somebody who's symptomatic, I would want to get them their symptom under control. So I would choose chemotherapy backbone with something else, um, and of course somebody with a good uh, PDL one more than twenty, there is the option of single agent immunotherapy, one in 19, you would use a combination of chemo plus pembro and less than, um, less than that, I would, I would probably just go with chemo plus cetuximab. But I think this is a very simplistic answer and it's very, you know, like very easy to say, let's do this. What we don't understand is sequentialing. I think that is something that we don't know because there is some data and there is Indian data that has, that has shown that, you know, maybe you should sequential, maybe you should do the EGFR with the chemo followed by the immuno 
Um, and we don't know if you give immuno upfront, what are you going to do with that patient afterwards? So yes, there are some guidelines that we can use like biomarkers, but um, I think the story is yet to unfold. In so, that. Dr. Aparna, this is now your turn, that biomarkers. So the guidelines say in relapse setting, they recommend that without that also we can give. So as a clinician, what we should look, which biomarker should be ordered and what should we look into the report? Very practical tips. Okay, so the three key biomarkers I would look for, which are of uh, therapeutic implications, are EGFR, HER2, NTRK. As a bare minimum upfront, I would recommend doing this just because we do have targets for them. And the propensity, the chance of a patient coming positive in any of these three is far higher versus, uh, you know, the other biomarkers. So this is from a treatment perspective. It again boils down to cost. If your patient cannot afford immunotherapy, you can go ahead and do a pdl one DACO2-2C3 or SP263. But what are you going to do with that information if the patient cannot afford therapy? So it might just be cheaper going ahead and doing a basic small NGS panel. Uh, we do have, and by we, I mean laboratories and service providers do have these very small focus head and neck based panels, which can help understand as to, you know, how to guide treatment options. So I would do an NGS, at least a basic one. So she had one. mentioned four markers. So how many of you do these four markers? EGFR, HER2, NTRA. <laughs> And PDL. So I think, but now actually patients are getting more and more smart and a lot of patients with metastatic disease will come up and tell you that, you know, I want to know my NGS. So, and as, as you rightly pointed out, knowing if, whether you do the comprehensive or you just do the small few markers. And also I would say things like TMB and MSI exactly. and everything, Absolutely. you know, especially where the agnostic uh, approval okay. is there, then, then that would I, be very helpful. Especially if your patient has money to burn. <laughs> So and even Tarasen, what Sorry. is your practice there in Mahavir Cancer Hospital? Which markers you do for head neck cancers for deciding about the targeted treatment? Uh, sir, we are doing IRC for PDL one SP263. If it is uh, more than CPS is 20 or more than 20, then yes, IO plus CT or uh, or IO alone. Other markers Depend are you using EGFR and NTREC and HER2? Uh, not sir, currently we are not doing NGS. We are if the patient is in second, third line and PS is preserved, then we can have a NGS if the patient is willing for that. To find if any aberrant marker we can find. Yeah, madam. Dr. Aparna, you want to say? Not even NGS, a basic RPCR of different patient can actually help get answers for this. So if you don't want to do an NGS because of the confidence rate, my discretion for you to and then also So you mentioned five markers now. <laughs> Sorry, <I didn't. laughs> so are we ready with the inaugural function now? Should we are we ready with that? So yet the, till the chief case comes, we will keep discussing something now. Because they are scared that if you... No, ma'am has come, but again... <laughs> <laughs> Dr. Jyoti Joshi is a very good friend of ours and she is one of the best fantastic persons we have ever seen in fact. So this is about the bevacizumab. One trial has been there. So any updates on that? Do we use or we discard this product now? So yeah. none of us is using the bevacizumab. This is about the P60 positivity in the head neck cancers. So P16 is available with IHC also in most of the lab. So how many of you consider P16 as marker for response assessment in immunotherapy or other tumors? So there, let me start with you. Do you do it or you don't do it? Uh, sir, not in the metastatic disease, but in the head and neck cancer, we do the P16, sir, more, mostly. But in the Maybe recurrent metastatic you, disease, there then. In Fortis Hospital, you do or you don't do it, sir? In apparent patients, we do, sir. In Dr. Dr. Chaudhary, you do it? Any implication? Anubha and Dr. Nya? Our surgeon, sir. Okay. So these are the options and I think we will not go into the detail of the combinations, various combinations. We will go into mainly the basics. So this comes important that CPS more than 20 and we all are tempted to use immunotherapy. Dr. Aparna, is there any way that we can have in the laboratory the CPS assessment 
other than having the standard method, will uh, the TIL or tumor infiltrating lymphocytes or something will guide us? There is work happening in that area, but as of now, it's not the lab. Some labs are reporting it, but reporting tills like CPS has a very different uh, methodology. And I don't think all the, like, no offense to the pathologist, but everyone's not trained in, uh, you know, kind of reporting tills. So as of today, only CPS is available for PDL1. And I think going forward, tills will be there. The only Tata does tills, if I'm not mistaken, as of today. Because yet the TIL is very much into into like many times pathologists they report as our pathology oncopathologists are reporting TILs and the percentage but we really don't know the implications and how to do interpretation they say that we need to do flow cytometry on these uh, TILs so we know clearly about the CPS more than 20 but what will happen about the CPS less than 21 to 19 so Dr. Ankur CPS if the score is between 1 to 19, how will you choose your treatment? It will connect. Okay, time. She says time. Okay. So just about the, the last few uh, comments. Uh, Dr. Ankur, your comments on this trial, low-dose immunotherapy? A very good trial for the patient who cannot afford the low-dose. Will you like to use low dose chemotherapy in all patients from Monday morning? For the patient who cannot afford that's a full dose of immunotherapy, yes. Very right. So in a in a particular subset. Yes. Dr. Anuba, how about you? I think the data is exciting and probably we need some more some more to, to give it as a standard. I would probably not use it as a standard, but as you said in Dr. Chaudhary, how about you in Delhi? Yes, yeah, same, same. So same I agree thing. with both my colleagues. So I think in a, uh, not in all patients, but in a subset of patients where finances are a barrier, we will use this low dose, but not in all patients. So I think I'll just share this one case with you that this patient presented to us in January 2018, left sided neck swelling. Uh, surgery was done, adjuvant chemo radiation was done. And then within a few months, this patient had relapsed. And we used chemotherapy then at that time in 2018, napaclitaxel plus cetuximab. And then March 2019, we started nivolumab. This patient from CGHS, so he was getting the drug regularly. And then we continued this for two years. And then we stopped. And the patient is sailing through metabolic response. And we can see these four pictures that the first one is at diagnosis. This is after the recurrence after surgery and CTRT. And this is progression after cetuximab plus paclitaxel. And the last one, we can say six months after the nivolumab therapy. And the patient is sitting through well almost four years after the diagnosis. And the patient is keeping well. So last PET CT we did around two years back, uh, one and a half years back. So it was sitting through very well. So sometimes we get good response, but we really don't know that how to uh, achieve these good response. Lastly, it becomes our moral responsibility to talk to our patient and their families about this topic of tobacco also. So I think that also remains very, very important that whenever we see head neck cancer patient, we ask them to stop tobacco and uh, we take active participation in the cessation services. And uh, with this, I thank all my panelists, all active participants in the hall. And I invite you in the month of January for this uh, Immuno-Oncology Society of India fourth annual Congress. And I'm sure that we all will enjoy. Thank you so much for your inputs. Mm -hmm.